Its industrial skills built the vehicles and its inner city areas were turned over to the people who drove them. The man who steered Birmingham into this future of underpasses, flyovers and multi-storey car parks was Herbert Mansoni, city surveyor and engineer for nearly 30 years until his retirement in 1963. Manzoni foresaw the problems of the motor car years and years ahead of his time and had this effect of restructuring the city in terms of the urban motorways. I think the problem that uh, Manzoni uh, didn't address himself to very much was in fact what the character of the city would be uh, as a result of this. How would you actually marry up a place where people have to work and walk around uh, and, and, and uh, enjoy themselves in with this, um, this car city, this, this urban motorway city? architect's dreams produced a city built in honour of the motor car. With hindsight, do Birmingham's politicians now recognise the failings of those ambitious schemes? Birmingham attempted to cope with the motor car before anybody else did and failed rather gloriously. Most people didn't attempt to cope with it. Uh, I think Birmingham's a reasonably good and easy city to drive through. I think the problem is we make it very difficult to get into Birmingham. It's all right if you're going from Leicester to Worcester, you can get through it very rapidly. Problem is, if you want to find somewhere in the middle of Birmingham, and you're a stranger to Birmingham, it's a bit difficult to do so. For twenty years and more to pass since I left Brummagem, but I set out for home at last to good old Brummagem. But every place is altered so, there's hardly a single place I know, and it fills my heart with grief and woe, for I can't find Brummagem. I was brought and brought up here and it's uh, been a terrific change in 20 years and I think most of that change I think we now realise has been very much for the worse. I mean the city that I was brought up in was a city of narrow streets, uh, still very much a Victorian city, a lot of old red brick buildings, a great deal of, of really nice buildings and a lot of charm to it, though people didn't realise that then. And what we've seen in the 20 years since is all these concrete tower blocks put up, we've seen the inner ring road built which flattened a good half of the city centre, so that you get now this image of in which people have, and I must admit that they have some justification in it, of a city that is all tower blocks and roadways and subways where you can't get across a street without going through three pedestrian subways. And it, it really does, I think, tend to put people off Birmingham, particularly from the outside, until they actually get to know the city. And it isn't always perfect for, for a lot of Brummies. What we've now got is more and more office accommodation, more and more fast food chains more and more major stores and cinemas and entertainment places closing down. So people are not encouraged to come into the city. It's dirty. There are parts of it that citizens of Birmingham are afraid to walk through, sad to say. The new development, of course, created problems of getting people across roads. Simple things, but nevertheless, things which had to be tackled in a complicated way. And because, by nature, we tend to be a complicated people, we've probably, therefore, produced uh, the most unacceptable way of getting people across the road which could have been devised, i.e. taking them through these underpasses, these unpleasant, I sometimes call them urine-scented underpasses. And quite obviously, that sort of thing is not civilised. In the old days, however, they were seen as the height of modernity the perfect embodiment of what the planners called functionalism. The underpasses were to be the safe, secure lifelines for pedestrians using the city centre. The main route uh, from this point to the city centre is through Newhall Street. Councillor Griffiths and I will now take an alternative route. He will cross on the surface and I will cross via the subway and we'll see how much longer it takes to be safe. <laughs> well, that was quite amazing. Yes. Um, across 80 seconds. Yes. How long did it take us? Uh, one seconds. minute, 20 seconds. Now, there's absolutely no hold-up on you going down the subway, whereas I had to stand on the central reservation, waiting for the traffic flow to slow down. No, and this, of course, accounted for some of the, uh, the extra speed that you made. So, obviously, it's much 
much better to go straight down the subway and have an unimpeded crossing. Yes. Few then foresaw the consequences of living in the age of the mugger. Less than a generation later, council leader Dick Knowles now sees the underpasses as ripe for early and decent burial. We should probably have to close, actually concrete in some of the underpasses. That's my own view about it because I think they're muggers' paradises and so forth and so on. And if you could actually block them off and if you've got the motor car out at the centre of the city, or most of the motor cars out at the centre of the city, then it'll be all right to walk on the roads again. And it's natural and reasonable, and the proper thing for people to do is to walk on roads, not clamber about under underpasses. We're men and women, not rabbits. As I wandered down a street as used to be in Brummagem, I know nobody I didn't meet, they've changed their faces in Brummagem. Poor old Spicel Street's half gone, and the poor old church stands all alone. And poor old I stand here to groan, for I can't find Brummagem. Like cities everywhere in the Western world, the plans for post-war reconstruction leaned heavily on the destruction of back-to-back -back houses and the building of high-rise tenements to house a fast-growing population. As the old back-to-back -back houses were demolished, with them too went long traditions of community living of street life and garden fences, and the personal contact that came with them. Despite the grime and lack of amenities in the old Birmingham, there was at least a kind of belonging, something all architects would regard as an essential ingredient of worthwhile urban life. The traditional notion of the street gave way to vertical living, with people isolated from their neighbours by hostile highways. This loss of community feeling was not foreseen in Le Corbusier's day, it's only now that we're beginning to recognise the cost. This area, St Paul's Square, in the middle of the Jewellery Quarter, however, is offering a model for rehabilitation. Trident Housing has built these flats for 38 single people to help create the broad social mix that once typified the area. I think what it may do is make the city centre much less of a derelict wasteland. I think people have become frightened because there's not a lot of uh, uh, through traffic of people. People have become frightened of underpasses and things like this af after dark and frightened of muggings. And the continuous flow of people around the city who belong to it and feel for it as opposed to dropping in, doing damage to it or whatever they want to do and getting out and not belonging, the sense of belonging and, and feeling a part of that environment is, is valuable in recreating not, not only the, the environment of bricks and mortar, but community. And we really have lost community. I can see St Paul's Square with not only lovely upgraded buildings as you look around, but, uh, but humming again with people, which is after all, in my mind, what it, what it was like probably 200 years ago, like, like a London Square. The Trident project shows there is a way of reviving the inner city breathing life back into districts that had apparently outlived their usefulness. But there's an even greater challenge of revival. With more miles of canals than Venice, Birmingham has a fascinating relic of the industrial age on its doorstep. But just as the ring roads give a grim view of truncated streets and the ugly backsides of buildings, so a trip through the canal network reveals another depressing side of Birmingham. Since the building of the ring roads and motorways, they've become neglected backwaters. But it needn't be so. A more imaginative outlook would see the canals as a priceless urban asset, potentially the backbone of the city's revival. The next thing that we need to be tackling is uh, recycling what we have already. Birmingham has got a marvellous asset in terms of its canals. That curious world which runs at 90 degrees from the one that you and I normally appreciate when we're wandering around a town. Now that canal system is something which can be the basis of, of development of the future. But it's just as vital to avoid the errors of the past. When the new Birmingham was going up, the canals were regarded as second-class transport. Better to disguise them between the concrete and steel of the skyscrapers. What's needed now is a strategy that emphasises the positive values of the canal system. Here at Canning Walk, a start has been made by refurbishing the canal side. More schemes like this would generate public interest in rehabilitating long-neglected corners of the city.
places like Gas Street Basin could be transformed by attracting pubs, shops and waterside cafes. I think we've got to try and get some character back to Birmingham and that's where areas like Gas Street Basin have got an immense amount to play because, you know, Birmingham has nothing except these canals and, you know, you, if you go to a city like London or Bristol, it's got a great big river and Birmingham's got this amazing potential which we're just perhaps beginning to, imp to, to start to get to, to work. We've actually started to get walking schemes down the canals and improvement schemes but we, I don't think we've gone far enough or fast enough. And you get a lovely area like this where there's those really nice cottages, Georgian cottages, and when you contrast those with the tower block behind, you can see, I think, precisely why people find the new Birmingham a bit of an eyesore. For years, Birmingham was proud to boast of its industrial prowess. Recession, bankruptcy and unemployment were practically unknown. The factories worked to full capacity. New ones went up with an energy and gusto that became the hallmark of the city. But the good times inevitably came to an end. Birmingham was old industry. And by the 1960s, when the skyscrapers were being built, the whistle had already been blown on hundreds of outdated workshops and foundries. The new Birmingham faced a problem that hadn't figured in the optimistic blueprints of Herbert Mansoni and his colleagues. The city now has to survive in a world of harsh rivalry for investment and jobs, for high-tech businesses that seem alien to Birmingham's workshop traditions. But there's an even bigger problem. In the battle to attract the businessmen of the second industrial revolution, appearances count. These days, decisions about the siting of a new office or factory don't rely simply on factors like raw materials and manual skills. Instead, companies are influenced by the physical character of an area, by its visual impact at first sight. I think to attract new industries, you've got to have an area which is attractive to the people who work in those industries, both to the workforce and to the senior executives. And very often the, the whole image of the West Midlands doesn't give that impression. There are real problems that need sorting out. I mean, it's, it's certainly not just one of PR. I think we have to really get to grips with the whole infrastructure, the look of the area, uh, the shopping facilities, the roads, um, the reclamation of derelict land, uh, the improvement of, of, of buildings to, to repainting and, and uh, rebuilding and so on. Uh, that's all got to be done, I would say, over the next five, ten years. So it seems the crunch point has arrived. Birmingham has to change its character yet again if it's to meet the challenge. But will it change for the better, reviving its inner city, giving it back to the citizens? That task falls to the planners at City Hall. The great thing about Birmingham is it's such a vibrant, lively place. It's a little place where people want to do things. You wouldn't perhaps come to Birmingham to look for the most beautiful old buildings in the world. Those are one or two pretty good ones, I might say, about. But by golly, you really would come to it for a place where people are alive, they want to get things done. It's the place where we're going to build the future. You can look at towns X and Y, and we can all name them where they're sunk in their past. We're not sunk in the past. We're about the future. A cornerstone of that future is a £100 million project for a convention centre here in the Broad Street and Gas Street Basin area with 11 convention halls, a leisure complex and a 500-room hotel. The go-ahead is expected soon, but will it be a replay of the 1960s? We shall build the convention centre with the experience we had of building the NEC. We shan't make mistakes on that. We hope we don't make mistakes on it. And uh, we shall have a design which I hope we can be proud of. I think it's a use of a site which at the moment is probably the biggest lump of derelict land in the centre of the city and ought to be used for that purpose. I believe Birmingham can be the convention centre not only for Britain but for Europe. The big conferences of the future are businessmen talking to each other, they're the surgeons discussing the latest techniques. They want to be in the centre, they want to be near the universities, all the special professional expertise. In that sense Birmingham's going to be the conference town of the future and that's going to bring people back. With people back, we shall develop our entertainments and other attractions. 
Birmingham's inner city headache is one of too much dereliction and too few jobs. Will the convention centre provide practical solutions, at the same time bringing rehabilitation and refurbishment? The city cries out for a policy that will integrate its various parts. The convention centre is aimed at putting Birmingham back to work. But at what price for the city's heritage? On this site once stood the Victorian Bingley Hall, now fallen to the bulldozers. It's believed to have been the first purpose-built exhibition centre in the world. Conservationists say it's been the focal point of a new convention facility, a marriage of tradition and technology. But following a recent fire, Bingley Hall was demolished. I think if we build this convention centre and try and get the jobs back to the inner city, we can either go about it one of two ways. We can either build a great big monolithic block like we used to build in Birmingham, like we have in the Bull Ring Centre, the Inner Ring Road, all these tower blocks that we've put up in the last 20 or 30 years. We can either build something like that, which I think people will grow to loathe the more they look at it, and it'll be impersonal and huge and no one will want to go anywhere near it unless they have to. Or we could build something small scale, nice materials, red brick, we could relate it to the canals, we could spread it out a bit more, you could walk from part to part of it using walkways or arcades even, we could do some planting, we could produce something that was really human in scale that people would like to use. And my worry at the moment is that because it's the conventional thing to do and it's the thing we've always done in Birmingham, people will go for the big grandiose solution and they'll think this, we're going to build a great big building which is going to be so impressive and it's going to wow people who come to Birmingham. And that, in a way, is the last thing we want. We want something that people will grow to like the more they use it and will grow on you as, as, you, as you go round it and will really be a nice experience to use as a building, not something that can be put on the front of a publicity brochure and look ma magnificently grand until you actually get somewhere near it. I've got concerns, as I suspect many people have, as to, as to the sort of nature and scale uh, of the scheme which may well be proposed. There may well be a desire to build high and I'm quite sure that that is something that we ought to be resisting. It seems to me that the opportunity for the structure of that area is there already and I hope that the new convention centre will have the wit to be associated with the canal, won't just turn its back on the canal as so much development has done in the past. So whose responsibility is it to design the cities that our children will inherit? Is it the architects, the planners, the politicians, or us, the people who have to live and work in them? The city is a partnership between all the people in the city. Uh, the public, the councillors, the officers, the planners, the architects, everybody who's involved in creating the, the city. There's no way in which one set of people can create a, a city for another set of people. Everybody has to be involved. If we're going to make it a city which is vibrant at night and things going on, if we're going to make it a city which is tidy, uh, looked after, cared for, green, and so on, the only way to do this is for everybody to be involved, to have people not throwing away uh, litter in the street, and to have people wanting the facilities, they wanting uh, to use a convention centre, to have a concert hall, to have uh, all the public facilities and specialist shops and so on that we re require. And this is what is important, is to want a great city, is to want a fine city. If we all did that, if everyone in Birmingham did that, we'd have a fine city. As the city comes to terms with a second industrial age, what will be the shape of the new, new Birmingham? Will it be once again a living city, a happy compromise of past, present and future? Too many of Britain's cities are the haphazard results of a series of accidents. As with all accidents, prevention is better than cure. The choice is ours.